My county commissioners, Commissioner Cecilia Jayapal and Lori Stegman are excused today. Audience members, I want to start by asking you to please silence your electronic devices. I'd also like to remind people that in addition to the people in this room, we also have people watching and listening online, so please consider your language and comments and testimony today. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Commissioner Myron moves, Commissioner Brim Edwards seconds, approval of the consent calendar. Um, Commissioner Myron. Hi. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Aye. Chair Vega Peterson. Aye, the consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is a time for board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, uh, at which point, please wrap up. We received six verbal testimonies and zero written testimonies. I'm gonna start with in-person testimony. We have Liz, uh, Lisa Schroeder, Charles Bridge Crane Johnson, and Lightning. Good morning. You can go ahead and begin. Should I? Hi, I'm Lisa Schroeder, uh, the executive chef and owner of Mother's Bistro and Bar in downtown Portland, and a concerned citizen. Um, I am here to implore you to allocate some of the excess unspent $48 million uh, that might be left from the Office of Homeless Services toward a tri-county detox center like we used to have with Hooper, a place for first responders and police to take people who are too intoxicated or too high to take care of themselves. We, part of what we see is this problem of uh, so high people can't move. We need a place, this is gone. The other thing we need is a cheers like van that used to take these people to this center. A place because our police, our first responders have no place to take these people. I also wanna throw in there that a day center for the people who now have no place to go between eight and eight, a cooling place, a place to just be would be really great for the city and for its citizens. That's all I gotta say. Thank you. Please, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Charles Simka Bridge Crane Johnson, and uh, in some jurisdictions, sometimes uh, elected officials do a little road show. Uh, they, instead of having people come to their meetings, they take their meetings to the people. And so I'm uh, all in favor of uh, seeing the Mother's Bistro edition of the road show so that we can go and get some real engagement about what's happening downtown instead of just having to look at weird stuff in the Willamette Week. I used to I travel up and down Sixth Avenue a lot, um, mostly inside buses, but I also walk, and I have never encountered the Willamette Week's masked, gun-toting Hondurans. Um, there's definitely problems on 6th, and of course they just drift back and forth between 5th and 6th, and I think that's some of the gist of uh, what Ms. Schroeder is talking about, is that we have people whose severe addiction uh, sometimes puts them in an almost zombie-like state, and we refuse to craft a resource that will help them, even though we have tens of millions of dollars, hopefully earning interest somewhere, uh, as we uh, try and figure out what to do with the SHS money. So um, if you took your child to a hospital and they said that they had a critical blood loss of maybe two liters, and they said, we're gonna give them 420 milliliters of fluids and thanks, goodbye, you would be upset with that physician. Uh, um, however, that is the way we respond to everything in the metro area. 
uh, we see a problem that is scaled at 2,000 people or 6,000 people, and we decide that we're going to address 194 of those people, and the rest can just tread water. Shame on them if they drown. So um, hopefully between the city uh, and yourselves, we can get an idea of how many people routinely are in the urban core. And really, of course, we need a comprehensive plan that addresses the whole metro region. But uh, we know that the worst uh, cycle of addiction is happening in an area where we leave these people with less services than we used to have while we actually have more money than we used to have. And your constituents, I think, are finally seeing that. And so I uh, look forward to uh, a lot of measures being implemented. Um, Hooper probably has limited capacity, we, um, but when we have things, like when the city comes over here and briefs us about how they're gonna implement the ca camping ban, and we never have bureaucratic officials give us a number, how many people do we think the camping ban is gonna be scooting through downtown? Um, you need that number so that you can figure out how many square feet of safe indoor space we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have lightning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Emergent. Again, when I asked the auditors to do an audit on the donations at the Multnomah County Animal Services, my understanding they have completed that. Again, I also asked that I have an audit done on all crematorium records uh, at the Multnomah County Animal Shelter. Uh, again, I want these donations to be watched very close. I want to make sure that the people who are donating their money are actually getting what they requested upon the donation. I want to look at the estate donations that have also gone to Multnomah County Animal Services slash shelter. I also want to have an understanding of any nonprofits that are affiliated and or tied directly to Multnomah County Animal Shelter. Uh, I want to know exactly what that relationship is and how those donations work. Again, my position on the euthanasia at Multnomah County Animal Services, I would like to put a ban on any and all behavior health euthanasias that take place until we do an extensive study to have a clear understanding on what level that you're, you're either at a level one to up to a level four, at what level are you making the determination to euthanize these animals? I also want to have a new behavior health center developed, possibly in Troutdale, to take care of these animals that are being euthanized, in my opinion, unnecessarily, unnecessarily. We need to have better behaviors brought in. We need to have professionals brought in. We need to have psychologists brought in. And we need to analyze why these animals are being euthanized because of their behavior. Now, if it's a court order by a judge, I'm not going to dispute the judges. But I am saying that I'm going to dispute the veterinarian's decision. I'm going to dispute anybody else's decision at the animal services. And I want to have a clear understanding on why you would euthanize any animal in this community because of its behavior. A very clear understanding on why you do that if we can have behavior health centers created that can alter and modify their behavior to where they can remain out in the communities and remain alive. Stop euthanizing animals because of their behavior if you don't know what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, virtual testimony. Um, and we have Frank Blackston. Frank, I'm going to unmute you, or you can unmute yourself and begin. Hey, great. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. 
Great, and thanks for your help getting me uh, online. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I wanted to speak today about getting these supportive housing funds out the door. Uh, I know y'all are very familiar with this topic, but I, I felt compelled to speak. Excuse me, could you state uh, your name for the record, please? Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm Frank Blackstone. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Do you need any other information from me before I continue? Nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I'm asking y'all to get the supportive housing funds out the door. The amount of people I still see on the street blows my mind when I hear how much money we have at the county level from these funds or from these taxes. Uh, I I mean, these are people that they're not, they're not safe, they have no security, they have no treatment options. Uh, and I just think we can do better. I know y'all are working hard. I'm just asking for more urgency and getting these funds out the door. Uh, I know from what I've heard and understand housing first is the priority, but I'm asking you to make immediate shelter options a priority also. Uh, these people need a place to go, uh, a safe place to lay their head, a safe place to get treatment. Uh, and I know y'all can do it. I know there are voices on, in the commission or on your county commission that they support this approach. And I want to say I support it too. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have um, <clears throat> Addie Smith. Um, Addie, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and begin. Hello. Can you hear me? Let me get a thumbs up. Yes, I can hear you. Can the board hear me? Yeah. Okay. My screen keeps going in and out. Okay, I'll start. Hold on. Start my video. Sorry. It won't let me. Okay. Okay, here we go. I see. Uh, can you? I don't know if you can see we me can or not. We can see you. Here we go. Hello, my name is Addie Smith. I wrote a letter about what I've witnessed and experienced living in Oregon. I mailed that letter to Jamie Harrison, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer, House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Senator James Clyburn, Senator Jeff Merkley, Senator Ron Wyden, Oregon House of Representatives Democrat Majority Leader Julie Fahey, and the squad. I've informed them of Governor Kotek and the Oregon legislature's refusal to either terminate Rachel Mortimer or suspend her without pay for refusing to remove, admonish, or reprimand the racist, law-violating, and corrupt judges in Washington County Circuit Court. I've informed them about Chief Justice Walters and the corrupt, inept, incompetent, underperforming Office of Public Defense Services and Director Jessica Kempf. I've informed these Democrat leaders about the systemic and structural racism and corruption in the Multnomah County Commissioner's Office and the Mead Building, specifically the racist and corrupt probation office. I've informed them about how black people, specifically black men, aren't safe in Oregon and about what has been allowed to happen to my son, Jalen Smith. I have informed them that I will be running for a Multnomah County Commission seat because there are no black people on the commission. There aren't currently any people on the commission committed to ending the systemic and structural racism in Multnomah or Washington County. I have informed them that because of Jamie Urbina, Brandon Taylor, Erica Pruitt, Multnomah County Commission Chair Jessica Peterson, Rachel Mortimer, and all of the Washington County Circuit Court judges, including and specifically Chief Judge Proctor, Kathleen Proctor, that my family and I who are registered to vote in Oregon will not be supporting President Biden for re-election. We will all be voting for whoever is the Republican candidate. Because women who lie about being survivors of domestic violence, we are starting a 501c3 to support the men they've lied on. And because my son was racially profiled by a park ranger and subsequently assaulted and arrested for being black and having a nice car while sightseeing at a national park, I will be demanding the new president that I will help elect terminate Director Charles Sams and Interior Secretary Deb Hallen. I am sick of voting for Democrats for office, and when we need them, we meaning black people, you think our vote is free. You think our vote is just going to be there for you because what's the alternative? Well, I'm going to show you all, specifically white women, 
what the alternative is when we black people can't get the support that we need to protect our children, to protect our own lives. And when you continue to allow these corrupt people and these corrupt judges to stay in I'm... positions in office. Thank you. Um, that's all for public testimony. Um, I'm going to move on to R1. R1. Second reading of ordinance amending chapter 25 to establish a waste, inefficiency, and abuse hotline for Multnomah County. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Broom Edward seconds. Approval of R1. Um, I am very happy this morning to bring um, forward this ordinance for its second reading um, that was um, created in partnership and really with the leadership of the auditor's office. As we discussed last week, adding this hotline to our county code will provide us with an important tool to successfully uncover cases of waste, provider overpayments, and other mismanagement. Giving people a way to file reports over the phone or via other methods helps us create the kind of county we believe is possible that improves our work and maintains open lines of communication and information sharing around these critical issues. I wanna thank Auditor McGurk and uh, Mark Rose for joining us today um, to answer any questions that we have. And if in opening it to you, if you have any comments for today too. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mark and I are here to answer any additional questions you may have about the ordinance. And uh, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, I'll call on commissioners um, by district to see if there are any questions. Uh, Commissioner Myron. Uh, no questions. Uh, I appreciate your presentation uh, at our board meeting last week and just applaud your efforts. I'm very excited about this. It's about communication, it's about transparency, and it's about accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Broom Edwards. As I said, when it came to a first reading, um, I'm very supportive. And um, I guess the only thing I just wanna make clear is like the, the, the hotline already exists, um, just so it's not, our action today is not establishing it, but it already exists. Uh, just for purpose of transparency, what's the number if people were to call it? Oh boy, let me. <laughs> Sorry, that was, this wasn't meant to be a trick question. Um, I don't have it memorized, it's an 800 number. We should have it memorized. It is on the front page of the county's website as well. So that is where I'm gonna go. And then, okay, it is, that's not the right one, 1-888-289-6839. And people can call that 24 hours a day or report online 24 hours a day. Thank you for the question. And yes, it is an existing hotline. This is just um, providing the legal, uh, county legal framework around it. Great. Um, and then the other, just clarifying question just for the public is, uh, can people make um, anonymous um, reports or are they all need to be? Um, yeah, the system we use allows people to report anonymously and then um, you know, the, at the end of their submission, they're given like a, a password so they can sign back into the system. So we can actually send uh, questions or ask for more information or communicate back and forth without them ever disclosing their information. It does kind of re require them to log back in uh, to check on the status. Um, but yeah, they can be absolutely anonymous. Um, and then of course, we, we always honor confidentiality, which is required by Oregon law. Um, for hotlines, um, so we don't disclose reporters in any case, but they can provide no actual information about who they are, yes. And if I could just add, it is very helpful if people are willing to share the information with us. It makes it a lot easier for us to pursue cases. And as Mark said, we're not allowed under state law to ever disclose the identity of people who report to the hotline. I don't have any other questions. I'm fully supportive of its continued existence and its uh, use as a tool for the county to improve its services and um, also spend taxpayers' dollars wisely. And thanks to the auditor's office for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I just, um, again, just want to reiterate some of the things I said last week, which is about, it's really, I think it's a very important um, thing to note that Multnomah County's Auditor's Office started this hotline even prior to it being in state statute. And I think it's um, high time that this was in our ordinance, and, I'm, and I just really want to um, appreciate your partnership again in, in getting to this place where we are today. And then uh, thank you, Mark, for all your work in, in um, managing this and being so responsive to the things that come through the hotline. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. It is about, um, as Commissioner Marwin said, it is about transparency, but also accessibility for governments to, our, to the public, and it's a really important thing. Thank you so much. Um, Tasha. did we have any public testimony today on this item? Yeah. Oh, well, we do now, and it's lightning. Okay, so thank you so much. Really thank you all. It. We really appreciate Thanks. it. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Emergent. What I wanted to basically emphasize on the auditors is I want to have a clear understanding. They have complete independence from the commissioners and the chair. I want them to also have complete independence on who pays them. I would prefer to have the state from the governor pay the auditors at the county so they can have absolute independence and no influence from any commissioners or the chair on any work that they do. So again, I fought for that over at the city of Portland for Mary Caballero. And uh, again, it is imperative that auditors have complete independence and they're not relying upon a paycheck from Multnomah County, the chair, the commissioners, and they will have no influence whatsoever from the commissioners or the chair on any audit that they do pertaining to any of the governance of Multnomah County. And I want to make that very clear. I do not know if this is state law at this time, but again, I do not want these auditors influenced by the chair or the commissioners in any way on these audits. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The second reading is approved and the ordinance is adopted. R2, notice of intent to apply for $447 million from the FY23 slash 24 uh, USDOT multimodal projects discretion grant program for the construction phase of the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves, Commissioner Brim Edwards seconds, approval of R2. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners. My name is Megan Neal. I am an engineering services manager in the transportation division, and I'm also the overall project manager for the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project. And I'm here to for you in front of you today to request approval of our notice of intent to apply for a 447 million grant from the MPDG grant program. <clears throat> As you are aware, we've been working really hard for the last several years to fully fund the Earthquake Ready Burnside Bridge project. Um, we have been targeting the Biden administration's uh, Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act as one of the uh, key revenue sources for this project. And so applying for this grant is, um, is, uh, is, is pursuing those uh, revenue funds that are in that um, um, act. Uh, we are proposing to match this uh, grant uh, request with 448 million of our um, of other funds, and those are comprised of primarily uh, federal funds we have received to date, which includes a, a congressional appropriation in the amount of two million dollars, as well as a five million dollar raise grant. Um, planning uh, grant. Um, in addition to that, we have a $20 million state uh, legislative um, uh, of funds that we received recently in the spring session uh, funded in House Bill 5030, uh, which dedicates uh, lottery bonds towards uh, specific projects. And then uh, finally, we have $421 million of bonds uh, serviced by our vehicle registration fee revenue. So that would total the $448 million 50% um, uh, match for this grant request. 
Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this grant request or the project in general. Thank you, Megan. We'll go to the board for any comments or any questions. And we'll start with Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, just a question that, so this is the um, notice of intent to apply. What's the, just at the very high level, the timeline for when it would be submitted and considered? Yeah, we are um, planning on submitting the grant um, on August 21st, that's the deadline, and we should hear back about if it's successful or not by the end of this year. Um, and uh, uh, and it, I just wanted to note that we're also submitting for another similar size grant in a few months from now. Um, we don't know the deadline of that grant per se. However, uh, we know that we would hear the results from that grant um, early next year. So we should have um, some good feedback about um, the viability of the future of this project uh, within the next six to nine months. And the, just for, um, to provide just broader context, so this, um, assuming we get the funding, it gets built, this, this would be the only bridge that is built to sort of withstand a Cascadia, I'm gonna use non-technical terms, a Cascadia level um, earthquake? In downtown Portland, yes. Um, the Selwood Bridge and the Savvy's Island Bridge have also been built to current seismic code. However, they're more outside of the downtown core. Um, at downtown, we really just have the Tillicum structure um, as the, our most recently constructed bridge that's built to seismic code. However, it's not as easy to get to as, say, some of our downtown bridges, and it's um, a bit more narrow, uh, meaning that's only a two-lane bridge servicing transit only. Um, there are also uh, the 405 overpasses on the west end would collapse on the routes to get to that bridge should an earthquake happen. So we don't truly have a uh, wide, seismically resilient bridge, easily accessible uh, on both approaches in the downtown core that could service us after a major earthquake. So in, in, in essence, we have, um, would have three main crossings in the, in the core that have seismic resiliency. I mean, I consider so, so would, uh, in the core. So you have Selwood, um, Telecom Crossing, and the Burnside Bridge. Because mm -hmm. Sylvie's Island doesn't go all the way across. Um, you can get to Sylvie's Island, but, um, or off of it. So we'd have th three in place, mm -hmm. and this would be the one that has the, the greatest capacity. Um, Absolutely, and what's so great about the Burnside Corridor itself, it's, uh, it stretches deep into uh, Washington County and into Gresham, so it's about a 19-mile corridor that really knits both sides of the river uh, directly, extending out into our community regionally. And then there are very, very few vulnerable structures or overpasses along it that could collapse, rendering the entire corridor impassable. So in terms of um, getting the biggest bang for your buck and when you select a bridge to, um, to replace, the Burnside Bridge is a pretty good choice because it strengthens that current weak link across the Willamette River that then in turn strengthens the entire corridor. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Myron. Thank you, um, thank you, Megan, yet again, uh, for for your presentation and for pursuing a partnership with the federal government and getting this grant um, and secure funding for the project. Um, I just want to clarify, like the the Tillicum Bridge, the egress and ingress to that bridge will it will not, is not seismically resilient. And so there will not be an on or off ramp for that bridge in the event of a, you know, Cascadia subduction zone event. Not immediately. The uh, approaches are constructed on liquefiable soil. So the bridge itself is resilient, but I think they'll take a bit of time to reconstruct the um, <laughs> approaches that sit on soil. Uh, that lead you up to the bridge. Um, and, and so it's not only the roads that go under 405 that bring you to the Tillicum Bridge on the west end, but also those, those ramps that are sitting on soil 
that lead you up to the bridge itself, those are also vulnerable. Okay, so you know, I wouldn't count that as a bridge that will be available to us in an emergency. Ex exactly, okay. not immediately <laughs> usable. Um, awesome, okay. And um, I just, uh, I appreciate you had responded to me, um, my questions that I'd raised about uh, an email, but I just wanted to flesh those out a little bit here. Um, looking at, you know, the increasing temperatures, uh, the ideas of climate resilience, um, earthquake resilience, all of this, are we incorporating plans for, you know, temperatures that could melt asphalt, or I, I don't know what it is, at, at this point, um, how are we evaluating that potential of extremes of climate in the future and determining like what those will be? Will we be like Phoenix will, for decades to come? Mm -hmm. Yeah, during the design phase, our engineers will look at um, key extreme weather events such as extreme heat, um, extreme precipitation, as well as flooding and um, tailor the materials in the design to those, um, for example, the, the temperature ranges either high or cold, what is their effect on our expansion joints that um, expand and contract according to the temperature, what is the effect of those temperature ranges on the asphalt we use on our approaches, um, what is the effect, if we are painting any steel, what is the effect of temperature over time on the sustainability of the steel product that we're putting on the bridge? In terms of flooding, we all, all have already embedded some design elements that account for a future sea rise or river rise or um, flash flooding. Um, due to the fact that we're removing foundations in the river on the east side to achieve those long spans over mm -hmm. I-5 and the railroad, um, that does uh, reduce the risk of flood impacts on the bridge itself because you don't have the bridge in the, um, exposed to that risk. And then additionally, the uh, supports in the river for the movable span, those will be designed to withstand debris loads uh, that may um, logs and branches and trees that come down the river during flooding and sort of back up and uh, apply pressure to the piers during high water events. And then also inherent to just having a bascule uh, movable span like we have today that really allows, uh, it really sets the bridge up for success in the future should the river have a sustained rise due to climate change or um, uh, during high water events, uh, by keeping the bridge uh, open, you have unlimited vertical clearance, so you're not really having the river limit the height of ships that can pass under your bridge. For example, a vertical lift like the Hawthorne, you would be limited. It's a constraint. So we are already including some elements that set the bridge up for success to be sustainable against uh, climate change, um, but then there's still work, more work to be done in the design phase by our engineers when making the refinements to the bridge components that we'll be designing. Great, that's, I mean, and I, obviously I do not, I'm not a bridge engineer, <laughs> um, but I've, I've really been thinking about this a lot, just hearing about, you know, what's happening in Phoenix or what's happening everywhere across our world. Um, but and thinking about not just isolated days or even a week of heat or whatever, but I mean duration, uh, not just the extremes in isolated cases, but long-term duration during these extremes. And uh, yeah, um, so that, that's all being considered by ex the people who are experts in this. Yeah, okay. especially <laughs> as we move forward into the design phase. Great. Um, no, well, thank you again for the presentation and for getting back to me so quickly. Thank you. So thank you, Megan, for your work on this, for the work of all of the bridge team on this. Our ability to go in and, and uh, you know, apply for these grants at the federal level, um, you know, is really critical for the funding of this project. And I think having the $20 million from the state this year shows that not only do we have the, the local investment in this project, we have state investment. So why not have some federal investment as well? We, we need this um, and, and we wanna go in with the strongest position possible. So I just appreciate all of the work that's going 
um, forward with this. I will say that you know this is a project I've obviously been working on for my whole time at the county, and um, what was really striking to me in learning about this project was the fact that we don't have a bridge even with the new bridges that are built that are gonna be immediately usable after the earthquake or immediately available for um, both first responders and the like major construction equipment that we think we would, you know, that we know that's gonna be needed after the earthquake for the downtown. And having the, even with the Selwood Bridge, I know that there was a, an issue with liquefaction of the soil above the bridge and that coming down and making that bridge inaccessible. So the the need that we have for this, the, the um, kind of the the wonderful like way that the Burnside Bridge does connect our, our region but also doesn't have a lot of different overpasses built over it that that also could make it unusable but you know has always made this such a strong um, candidate for this type of rebuilding to make it the the earthquake you know um, resilient bridge that we need for downtown and I think the other thing that I just want to stress is how critical having that connection is going to be for our city, for the Portland region, and really for our whole state for an economic recovery should a Cascadia event occur. And just knowing that it's not a question of if this is gonna happen, it's a question of when it's going to happen, which is something that I'm sure keeps keeps people up at night as <laughs> who are, who are um, working on this. So I just uh, appreciate this. I wanna um, you know, wish you and the team the best of luck for this and we look forward to finding out um, how, this, how this grant goes. Thank you. Thank you. Did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, maybe we have a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye, the notice intent is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. R3, proclaiming August 1st to 7th, 2023 as World Breastfeeding Week and August 25th to August 31st, 2023 as Black Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Commissioner Myron moves, Commissioner Brim Edwards second, approval of R3. So good morning. Um, we know that today's proclamations is about something very important to our communities and to me, the need to do everything we can to assist and protect parents and their babies. As a mom, an aunt, a friend, I know how critical these first few months of a baby's life are to long-term health and wellness, not just for the baby, but for entire family systems. At Multnomah County, we believe it's critical that every parent is able to make the choice to feed their baby in the manner they want to, including breast and chest feeding. We also know that the best way forward is to make sure every choice is available and explored through education and awareness, which is why I so appreciate our incredible racial and ethnic approaches to community health, or better known as REACH, team for their partnerships in bringing education and economic support forward to assist families in making informed choices for their health and wellness. This is work is designed to redress chronic disease burdens and disparities among black and African immigrant and refugee populations in Multnomah County people in our community who deserve and benefit from culturally specific programs designed specifically to serve their family and their needs. That's one of the things today's proclamation and Black Breastfeeding Week later this month calls out and reminds us of. I also wanna say thank you to everyone associated with our Women, Infants, and Children's, or WIC program, designed to provide thoughtful resources to any family member, parents, grandparents, foster parents with a child under five. It is through WIC that many families get the additional support that they need after the birth of a new baby and have the opportunity to make the best choices around feeding and all sorts of other things surrounding baby care. As breastfeeding counselors through WIC are a huge asset in the work to help parents and babies get the nutrition that they need. So I'm so excited today to welcome several breastfeeding specialists and advocates to help us make the most of this proclamation and our chance to spread this word um, about the benefits of breast and chest feeding. And this includes a few folks who are involved in today's uh, Breastfeeding Week virtual town hall, um, which is focused this year on addressing the difficulties faced by parents diagnosed with gestational diabetes during pregnancy. So I am welcome the opportunity to learn more about that specific issue. Um, so I welcome you today. Thank you so much for being a part of this presentation. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Chair Jessa Vega-Peterson and esteemed 
commissioners. It is such a privilege to be here. I am Sabrina Villemene. I am your WIC program nutrition program manager. New title. <laughs> <laughs> New title. Ten days in. Um, <laughs> so happy to be here with my esteemed colleague, Cherish Wanters. The presentation will go first with a PowerPoint and then I will share the proclamation reading today and thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, um, Chair Vega Peterson, for sharing your thoughts on breastfeeding and for acknowledging the work being done by REACH and WIC. My name is Cherish Wenser, and I work for the WIC program as the Nutrition Program Specialist, focusing on culturally specific programming. I'm going to be doing this presentation with my colleague, Michaela Hill, which, who's going to be doing it virtually as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michaela Hill, and I serve as the Nutrition Health Promotion Specialist for the Multnomah County REACH team. And we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. All right. So next slide, please. So REACH, or Racial Ethnic Approaches to Community Health, this is where the Multnomah County REACH program comes in. Our work is grounded in cultural preservation building on the strengths of the community to promote health equity using community-based participatory processes. We leverage partnerships, community voice, and resiliency while promoting social cohesion and economic development in order to counteract the toxic stress caused by socioeconomic inequity, racism, and forced displacement. Multnomah County REACH cultivates cultural pride and community connection. Next slide, please. So in Multnomah County specifically, black mothers do initiate breastfeeding at a rate of 92% of white mothers, but only 55% of black and African mothers who breast breastfeed exclusively still do so after eight weeks, compared to roughly 70% of white mothers. Because of our partnership with WIC and the Healthy Birth Initiative, or HBI, we learned that there are not many black providers providing lactation support. Having culturally specific resources for new moms and families is crucial to their breastfeeding success. So the focus of our breastfeeding strategy was to increase continuity of care and community support among the REACH focused population. Next slide, please. So in Multnomah County specifically, black mothers do initiate, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. Um, so, so, so here are some um, numbers we wanted to share. So um, 19 new and approved sites is some numbers that we can highlight this year. Or sorry, which slide am I on? There you go. Uh, yes, yeah, so here are some highlighted numbers. Um, so we have 19 new and improved sites, 32,000 residents reached, 24 black certified lactation counselors trained, five health system partners, one employee breastfeeding campaign, one feed nourish love campaign, in one mobile lactation support program. Slide, please. So another success we wanted to highlight was our partnership with the African American Breastfeeding Coalition of Oregon, or APCO. This coalition was paused for several years, but was eventually um, reconvened through the REACH activities and partnerships focusing on policy systems and environmental changes. Starting their own 501c3, um, CLC's members of APCO are advocating for policy systems and environmental change, assist in community uh, communication campaigns. All right, next slide, please. So um, this beautiful tent is an example of our work together. It's a lactation station that was born out of the desire to provide moms with the option to feed their children in a comfortable space not a bathroom, a hot car, or uncomfortably dealing with public stairs. When they're out and about at community events, our lactation station debuted at June um, at events for Juneteenth, 2019, and has been made appearances at many other community events throughout the county. Next slide, please. So another success we'd like to highlight is the creation of our lactation space in outer Southeast Portland on the um, border with Gresham at Rockwood Market Hall. We wanted to highlight this specifically because it is a physical embodiment of our efforts, and that can be rare in public health field. 
More and more of Reach's focus population is being dispersed and pushed out of Portland proper and into Southeast Portland and Gresham, a neighboring city. Southeast Portland and Gresham have a lot of highways and suburbs and not as many community hubs as North and Northeast Portland, where most of the Black and African population used to reside. Rockwood Market Hall is a newly built community hub with restaurants, shops, and playgrounds, and a splash pad. Next slide, please. So in partnership with REACH and ABCO, adding a lactation space makes it that much more accessible to families. A lactation room allows nursing parents to have the privacy and calm to nurse while out in the community. Fathers as well as mothers are encouraged to use this, this space. It can also provide a much needed respite for children and people with neurosensory disorders. REACH and ABCO partnered with the city of Gresham for this space. It has a comfortable armchair, a small table and chair, a sink, a waste um, basket, um, as well as a diaper basket, plant, artwork, and a pin code access. Next slide, please. So what's next? REACH plans to continue with our normalizing and promoting of breastfeeding. We want to encourage businesses to create lactation spaces for working parents so that breastfeeding doesn't have to be the casualty of returning to work. We are currently working with the Portland Airport to create a campaign to raise awareness, and we are also designing some bus bench and billboard ads. We recently had a photo shoot with local families and are planning to use the photos for our campaigns. The campaign will launch this August, right now, um, with posters and messaging at the airport, an online campaign and ads around the city, and likely in newspapers as well, which is also planning to host an event at the airport to highlight our work. So this is one of the mini postings for the next slide, please. Sorry. This is one of the mini postings for the Feed Nourish Love campaign to normalize breastfeeding. It shows local woman feeding her infant on a bus stop bench. I please. And I will hand it to my colleague, um, Cherish Walter. Thank you all. Thank you, Michaela. So I'm going to be talking about the Women's Infants and Children Program, which is most commonly referred to as WIC. So the WIC program provides um, support for families that have a child under the age of five under guardianship of their parents, foster parent, grandparents, and any other approved guardian. The program provides support in four areas, um, supplements of food each month, nutrition education, breastfeeding education and support, and service referrals to other programs. Next slide. Our lactation program is supported by Ms. Sabrina right here. Um, and it includes a diverse group of breastfeeding counselors. We provide um, support in two ways, one-on-one -on -one support, whether it's through texting or phone conversations with the peer counselors or with Ms. Sabrina doing IBCLC level work with the families. We also provide group classes where moms have the opportunity to kind of bond with each other, build that communities for themselves. And those are culturally specific, including a black moms group which we've been able to open out to all community members to participate in that. And then our Spanish speaking groups, which is exclusive to WIC participating moms. Next slide, please. We're excited to share our accomplishments. So we have a partnership with State WIC to expand those cultural groups across Oregon to reach families that are in areas that doesn't necessarily have those culturally specific programs in place. Um, we also were recently awarded the Breastfeeding Gold of Excellence for 2023 by the USDA that we're celebrating today. And lastly, we also had a breastfeeding photo shoot to just highlight the families in our program and the commitment they've made to breastfeed through the years. And all of the pictures you've seen on these slides were taken directly from that photo shoot. Again, just to represent the diversity that our program provides. And I guess the slide didn't transfer, but we had a picture for our team as well that just highlighted all of our members on our breastfeeding team. And I'm just gonna speak their names in the space right now. We have Sydney Potter, which is one of our CLCs, Tara Presley, one of our other certified lactation counselors, Ana Ektame, Berenice Arango, Rosita Rosario, Sarita White, Estela Jimenez, and Johanna Hernandez. Did I miss any? No. Okay, I'll pass it to you. Cheris Warner. And, <laughs> <laughs> and myself as the program specialist. For folks watching, if you have any questions on how to connect with this program, you can see our contact information on there as well. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. 
So this is a day that we're celebrating and we're celebrating you as well, chair and commissioners, because of your support for WIC and for REACH, we're able to um, reach out to the community in more ways than one, not just in our programs, but the community at large. I wanna share one thing before I read the um, proclamation. Chair Jessica Vega Peterson, I met you last year on Christmas Eve at the DRC. Do you remember? Yes. yes. <laughs> I want to thank you for modeling leadership. Leadership starts with service. It was about seven o'clock in the morning, and that was a really challenging day. But you modeled it, and I've kept that in my heart. So thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have the privilege of reading this year's proclamation to our chair and commissioners and i thank you this is my soapbox so it does get me all choked up i hope you guys can go there with me that's and why we put the kleenex there don't yeah. go for it <laughs> <laughs> thank you and i don't mind can i stand up mm -hmm. all right oh just stay don't get too far from far the from the mic there you are. i've got a preacher's voice <laughs> yeah thank you before the Board of County Commissioners for Multnomah County, Oregon. Proclaiming August 1st through 7th, 2003 as World Breastfeeding Week and August 25th to August 31st, 2003 as Black Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds, number one, August is National Breastfeeding Month, an initiative designed to celebrate, support, and promote awareness of the benefits of breastfeeding. Number two, the World Breastfeeding Week campaign aims to inform, anchor, engage, and galvanize action on breastfeeding and related issues. Number three, Black Breastfeeding Week is an initiative intended to celebrate and encourage black women to breastfeed. Number four, racial inequities in breastfeeding rates persist and are the result of barriers in healthcare, employment, and community settings, as well as racial and ethnic discrimination. Five, Multnomah County recognizes the physical and mental benefits of breastfeeding for both babies and mothers, as well as the importance of reducing racial disparities in health care and birth outcomes for babies. Six, Multnomah County recognizes the importance of having employer-focused breastfeeding as employers that provide work, place, lactation support experience, an impressive return on investments, including lower health care costs, absenteeism, and turnover rates, and improved morale, job satisfaction, and productivity, and breastfeeding is economical, providing its benefits at little to no cost, and providing a safe, renewable food source, especially critical during natural disaster in emergency situations. Seven, Multnomah County is committed to establishing a breastfeeding medicine healing and training center dedicated to improving the health outcomes and infant mortality rates of mother baby dyads of color by providing access to culturally supported evidence-based lactation consultant provider services for women of color in Oregon. Eight, promoting diversity in, lact in the lactation field and applauding the work of community breastfeeding champions is very important. And Black Breastfeeding Week provides the opportunity to engage government agencies community-based organizations and academic institutions to share this message and work together to engage in equity efforts in their communities. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims 
August 1st through the 7th, 2003, as World Breastfeeding Week, and August 25th to August 31st as Black Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon, in recognition and celebration of the importance of breastfeeding in our community. This is adopted this third day of August 2023, in the year of our Lord, by Jessica Vega Peterson, our chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really beautiful reading, Sabrina. Um, are you, are you, anything else or? Yeah. I just wanted to share, we have a couple of presenters that are online. Um, today is our second annual breast chest feeding town hall. I wanna let you know what you and our teams are doing in Multnomah County. We have people coming, logging in from California. Last year we had someone from Hawaii. We have our NINAC, which is the Native uh, Indigenous Native American um, WIC Association, logging in for this free continuing education. This is how we're reaching our community and others. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. David Griffin and also um, uh, Denea Hall. She's a registered nurse and also a nurse practitioner. Um, and they're gonna share a little bit of, about our town hall. And I wanna welcome you all to attend. Last thing, Nisha, who is my director, thank you for being here. Thank you for leading by example. Veronica Erickson, I love you, and Charlene McGee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and welcome to the, our guests who are joining us online. Hello, um, Denea and Dave, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, great. We can see Dave now. Oh, wonderful. We can see both of you now. Welcome. Today, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I just want to, so my name is Denea Hall. I am a women's health nurse practitioner. Um, I also am the founding president of the Alliance of Black Nurses Association of Oregon. Um, and I'm a nurse practitioner at Kaiser Interstate in the OBGYN clinic. Um, and I just want to, you know, thank Sabrina and her team for inviting me to be a part of this second annual breastfeeding, chest feeding town hall. That was a beautiful proclamation. Um, and so it's really exciting to me um, to be a part of this because it really speaks to uh, my commitment to the black community in particular, but also communities that are experiencing systemic racism and inequities um, in healthcare, especially maternity care um, and breastfeeding, chest feeding really is the foundation for that. Um, and so I just want to, I've worked with um, the REACH program and I've known Charlene for quite some time and it's really, uh, I'm excited to continue this work of representing our community, giving good health care to our community, good counseling for our community. Um, I'll be speaking about gestational diabetes today and really focusing on what, not only you as a patient who might get that diagnosis or have it can do, but also what we can do um, as providers and leaders in our healthcare to really look further into the inequities that are barriers to health and breastfeeding and really start to dismantle those systems um, and also to really reach into our communities and engage them to become the next generation of BIPOC leaders um, because representation is a huge part of healing 
um, and promoting the health and wellness of our community. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, it really means a lot. I've been doing this work for about 15 years um, and I am really passionate about it and I love it. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson and to uh, Commissioner Brim Edwards and to Dr. Commissioner Aaron, our emergency room doctor, as I understand. Um, I come to you with great thanks and appreciation. My, my name is Dave Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N. Um, as, as it turns out, I'm probably the furthest away from breast um, feeding as you could get in the body being at the feet because I'm a foot doctor. But um, I, there's a bridge between there I'm gonna share with you, but the opportunity to be here today is just wonderful. As a white male who doesn't really know a lot about breastfeeding, I've learned a lot. And I can tell you that the bridging in the communities to uh, get men to probably be more accepting of breastfeeding is, is probably as big, if not bigger than for women to accept breastfeeding. Uh, but I would share that um, the relationship I see with Sabrina is that she's a, she's a force of nature and she's gonna make this program grow. And uh, I cherish as her right hand woman and they're gonna keep moving ahead. And I would just say, give them more money, let them do their thing because they're, they, they've got the right approach. Um, what I look at is you might say, okay, Dave, so where does the breastfeeding fit to the feet? Well, it really fits in movement because for moms to be healthy during their pregnancy and postpartum, they need to keep moving because if they don't, they gain weight. And guess what? We have an obesity problem in our world. And uh, that problem continues to escalate in all of the generations. So when you look at it, they're really at the beginning of the food chain, if you will, because they are the food, right? But the idea, the way it goes, is that if you continue to monitor that and get them moving, they're going to create healthy and more successful um, uh, health care for themselves and, and model for their kids as they grow up. So the diabetes is my world. Um, I deal a lot with people with diabetes foot infections. I'm sure Dr. Niren can tell you that people show up in the emergency room and it just seems like they get piece after piece after piece cut off their foot and then their leg. And nowhere is that bigger than in the racial disparities that exist not only in our county and in our community, in our state, but also nationally. And they're magnified in that, you know, um, black people have uh, 2.5 the number of amputations as white people do latinx and indigenous americans are also more than white people and we know that those are very complex issues but it really we see it boils down a lot to poverty and lack of access to quality medical care so my focus is really to kind of help with that quality medical care and um, i uh, i work as a clinical assistant professor at ohsu and part of my role there is i teach new doctors how to examine feet because Dr. Mirren could probably tell you that when she was in medical school, she probably got about an hour of what to do for feet. And the rest of the time, they don't know what to do. So they're very uncomfortable with feet. So um, I'm trying to bridge that gap in the community around awareness of peripheral arterial disease, which is a big, big problem. And then also this development of skill development in the primary care level to feel more comfortable with feet because even though the American Diabetes Association recommends that uh, people with diabetes have their feet checked once a year, uh, if you look at the charts, it's about 30%. And so I'm encouraging patients and working with Reach, uh, Charlene and Miss Carrie and Miss Kite on trying to figure out how do we uh, help people embed um, the ability to be self advocates because the healthcare community is very quickly turning into a self advocacy role. Just try to get a referral from your doctor to someplace and you'll see what's happening. But my program I've been dealing with to my, my friends from the diabetes community, it's called Love One Another. And that's how I met uh, Charlene. And uh, I think I did a talk at University of Portland and, uh, and uh, Miss Sabrina heard that. And so um, I think when you think about feet, you think, well, gosh, this is not really maybe this way. Well, I would argue to you that food and movement are medicine. And until we kind of embrace that in our communities and figure out ways to make it affordable, accessible, and keep our bodies moving, um, we're gonna have a lot more problems. And so uh, my goal today is to share that, bridge that together. So if you want to have some fun and learn some cool things, uh, pop into my, uh, my session and I'll be sure to entertain you and help teach you a bit about feet.
Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Thank you. Thank you uh, all for being here today. I'm sure we'll have comments from the board. So I'll go ahead and um, start with Commissioner Myron. There's so much, uh, so much there. I'm actually glad this is a relatively short board meeting. Um, wow. Uh, first of all, just, and mainly I want to express gratitude to all of you um, for the work that you do every single day and for being here today to share it with us and, um, and deepen our understanding and education about all of these issues. Uh, Sabrina, congratulations on your new job. You know, hopefully it'll just flow off the tongue very soon. And, um, you know, I think you should put preacher in there. And Dr. Griffin mentioned force of nature. Like, you can just add those on because uh, they are so apparent. And you know, there's so much you said, but it kind of your beautiful rendition of the proclamation kind of overshadowed a lot of things because it was so beautiful and um, and heartfelt and deep. And so uh, clearly it came from your soul and I really appreciate your standing up and, and owning it. Um, and, uh, you know, so many other, Michaela, I don't, I don't know where people are now, but um, I really appreciated the, uh, the description of the work that, that you, done, you have done and some of the um, things that are in the works. Cherish, wow, you are doing so much. And with WIC, congratulations on your award. And, you know, add, again, it sounds like we need to add superheroes to lots of our, our <laughs> titles here, but uh, you are really there and making a difference for so many. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I love how the proclamation today really um, tied into exactly what all of you spoke to, and it's about that celebration, promotion, and support uh, for black breastfeeding. And, um, you know, within there, one thing I really love that you, re that it references is not only the physical health of babies, um, and setting them up for nutri you know better nutrition, success, all sorts of health benefits, but mental health and the mental health of the moms that um, you know sometimes gets overlooked, and it is so important. And I, I really appreciate that emphasis. And along with the celebration, talking about the profound inequities that exist, particularly. Um, in healthcare uh, and the racial inequities and particularly maternal child health care for black women. I mean, that that is something that is so deep and we need to be having sort of a multi, like we need to be attacking that from all angles. And this Black Breastfeeding Foundation also love the work um, and love tying all of that together to address inequities. And um, D I don't know if it's Denea or Denaya, and so I'm so, do you, it's? Denaya. 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 Thank you. I, I, you know, the passion and the work that you're doing is so cool. And I'd, I'd read some additional, you know, some more about your work and just um, thank you for all that you're doing uh, for the community, for the world. Uh, and Dr. Griffin, you really did such a great job highlighting how the inequities manifest in, you know, Patient by patient in the ER, I do, I see it. And yes, foot care is, and diabetic foot issues are where things really come up. And um, and we see that, I see that, and I'm like, oh my God, a foot, ah! You know, and um, let's, you know, check. I, I have learned how to examine feet, just don't worry. But don't it's, worry, it's. Here. And I'll, I'll invite you to my next foot camp. We do foot camp instead of boot camp. It's foot camp. So you, you, you've got a, a like scanning it. indication. I like it. Um, but but 
tying the brought the disparities to people and the impacts on on individuals' lives and um, how we can um, empower people to become self-advocates because unfortunately that is becoming more and more of a necessity, but how do we empower people to to breastfeed, to um, be in space, and to empower people through our businesses supporting um, women um, where they work to breastfeed. Uh, I'm pleased we have a lactation room um, here. Can you remind me where it is? I think we have a lactation room somewhere in the, the county building. I have By Kayla? There's one on the fifth floor. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Floor. Okay. She would know. <laughs> I think there's more than one in this building, actually. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Good. And, um, and just all of this work being out there, the PR campaign, putting all of this together, this is just a brilliant presentation um, and it highlights the brilliant work that is being done. And Nisha, and, and I don't wanna forget anyone because um, your whole team is, is incredible. So thank you, keep up the great work and thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner My uh, Brim Edwards. <coughs> Good morning. Um, thank you. For, thank you. For, thank you for the presentation, uh, but also the f powerful reading of the proclamation. Um, the only thing we're missing is a couple babies here this morning. <laughs> um, and I also want to thank you for creating the infrastructure for mothers and specifically black mothers to be able to successfully breastfeed. Um, as a mother of three, it was a while ago. Um, but I know that there's many factors that conspire against um, mothers who know it's healthier for their child to be able to breastfeed, but um, the built environment, our policies and our practices in our communities, um, in many cases, make it exceedingly difficult. Um, so I really appreciate um, the intentionality of what what is needed um, to help uh, allow mothers to be successful in this. And um, I look at just from my own experience, um, work, there's workplace, especially for working moms, workplace policies that um, again, um, make it exceedingly difficult to, um, whether it's the policies or there's no place to, um, to, to breastfeed, that make it very hard for uh, moms to be um, successful. Um, I want to specifically call out the, um, I loved your slide with the, by the numbers um, and the lactation consultants um, that you have, because that is such a critical uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, it seems intuitive um, that moms don't know how to breastfeed. <laughs> um, but as I know, um, for, fortunately, I had two sisters who were um, both pregnant at the same time, and we um, they went first with the delivery of their um, their children, and so I had like a mini support group, but, and one of my sisters had had, um, it was her second child, um, and I know how critical that is because there are some things that are not intuitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's also not only is it some things that are not necessarily intuitive, but also, again, the built environment, I can't um, count the number of times, the crazy places um, that you ended up in trying to um, breastfeed, that um, were not appropriate. So I, I love the fact that um, you have both support groups, um, lactation uh, consultants that people can contact to get information because um, I do think those are really the keys um, to being successful because sometimes you just have to st stick with it um, and have other people who are supporting you along the journey. Otherwise, um, it's there are a lot of things that make it easy to stop, um, even if you um, really want to and are committed to it. Um, so I really appreciate that um, you're creating both a physical environment, which makes it easier, and also creating the support structure, which um, I think will f facilitate it. So um, thank you for that work and also the proclamation this morning, um, and I'm enthusiastically going to support it. Yeah, and I just um, thank you, Denea, and um, 
Dr. Um, Dr. Dave Griffin, thank you so much. Um, everything that you've done, um, Michaela and, and Cherish and Sabrina, thank you so much for the work and bring this forward and really your pro your your power that you bring to this work and your passion and just the um, like really strong knowledge of how important this is to mothers, to families, to children, to you know everyone who is engaged in this kind of work and um, the. I, I mean, we've, we've, we do this um, almost every year I've been here, I think, or, or we have done do it annually now. And it's so, we always get to share our stories of our own experiences with breastfeeding. And I think that the, for me, the core thing is like, it is something that um, people want to do, mothers want to do, any parent who's breastfeeding wants to do, but it's, it's also challenging. And having the support through that, having, um, People from your from your community, from from your own um, experience, being able to walk that with you and be there for you and support it is so critically important. And um, I love what I heard today around you know the holistic approach, right? It's not just about breastfeeding or chest feeding. It's also about um, Dr. Griffin. You were talking about you know the walking and the movement throughout like pregnancy, so that we are. Um, trying to be um, proactive in, in helping people be well, stay well, and avoid some complications in a way that doesn't have to do with you know, medicine or severe medical intervention, but it's really just about movement, it's about walking, it's about um, what we can do for that, and that's, that's really critical. But I also loved what I heard about helping people become their own advocates and using their own voices and their experience. I think when we look around and we see um, the disparities in, um, in uh, maternal health outcomes for black women, we know that having voices heard and believed and raised up is critically important. I think the work that we're doing today with this proclamation is a piece of it, but I think the work that you all are doing every single day is the most important part of that as well. So I would just wanna really thank you for everything that you're doing in our community. Thank you for the, the really amazing reading of the proclamation today and having and giving us the chance to, um, to celebrate, to lift up this work and um, I really, um, am excited for the second annual um, uh, town hall that's happening, guests from all over. I think that's really incredible and um, I'm glad it's becoming a tradition. So thank you for all of your work so much. Thank you, Chair. Um, with that, we will have a vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Aye. Chair Vega Peterson. Aye, the proclamation is approved. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. And I think if folks can stick around, we'll probably do a picture. Yeah. We have Matoya here after board comments. So thank you so much That's for wonderful. that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So that concludes our regular agenda for today. Now we have time uh, for comments from the board. I'll call on commissioners by district to see who has any items to discuss today. And we'll start with District 1. Thank you. Um, I first just, let's see, I wanted to just let fellow commissioners know that uh, my intern, Ginger, uh, and I toured several uh, micro villages and alternative village sites uh, this week, I guess. And uh, we spoke with some residents and those include um, Hazelnut Grove, Dignity Village, St. John's SRV, Kenton Women's Village, Right to Dream, um, and we have another another schedule planned um, for some other sites, and I would just encourage you to re to actually go to the sites and talk to people because um, it really is eye opening, and not just sort of the shelter sites that we that are are um, are you know sort of county operated, but but some of the other sites as well. So I'd be happy to share some of the information there. And um, I will be attending a health justice forum at St. Anthony Catholic Church. Uh, um, it's, it's in Tigard, but it's very relevant and with people from Multnomah County uh, on August 12th, 3 to 6 p.m. And it's a bilingual event aimed at addressing health disparities and promoting health justice for all, specifically those who have had to navigate healthcare systems in jail. It's uh, tragically um, relevant uh, right now in light of the recent revelation of five people 
dying in our county jails over a period of months. And I just wanted to take a minute to sort of address, it, not address it, but um, talk about it a little. Uh, you know, we're visiting the jails tomorrow. We we're scheduled to visit annually, and you know, when we we go, it's all best foot forward. There's preparation and stuff. You know, I think having spot visits, spot audits, you know, might be something to consider. But particularly with the five deaths since May, I believe. You know, in medicine, we call things like this when they happen in the hospital a sentinel event, and that's a serious adverse event that results in patient death, permanent harm, or severe temporary harm. It requires immediate investigation and response. That's essential to protect patients, improve systems, and prevent future harm. So um, I really would like to understand, um, you know, what is being done to treat these deaths as a sentinel event so we can have answers and make changes to protect others entrusted to our care um, urgently. And so that's just kind of putting that out there. And then um, also for animal services, uh, I spoke with a number of volunteers um, earlier this week as well who did express some major concerns with continuing to relate to euthanasia, animal behavior, animal welfare, and um, I mean, I was sort of saddened. It, it, I was crying um, hearing what is continuing to go on, and so I just would love to um, talk about what, what has happened and um, how we can support our volunteers as well who are doing this work, uh, who we should be celebrating kind of every day. Um, so those are things on my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess I want to just raise the, the topic of um, our agendas. Um, we've got a record number of homeless people on the streets without access to basic services and uh, without a path to supportive housing. We have million dollars, millions of dollars of unspent funds and I'm concerned uh, just about the, the pace and the transparency of the work that's underway. So we had a um, meeting two weeks ago in which we discussed the or had a presentation on the discussions with Metro and the, 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 the unspent funds and also the unanticipated funds. And I know we have something scheduled for next week, um, but we really didn't have a substantive discussion at that meeting. And then looking at our upcoming agendas, we have meetings that are canceled on the 15th and the 17th. Um, and I'm concerned that the urgency with which we're moving ahead or just the, the transparency. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of activity in the joint office and other places happening, but it's not transparent. And I'm concerned about the, sort of the decision-making process that um, we, we have um, and, and how it's connected to a larger strategic plan on our approach to homelessness and not just around spending, spending the dollars um, but spending the dollars in a way in which we can show measurable progress in moving people from the streets um, to having access to ba basic services. Um, so I'm just, cons as a individual commissioner, concerned about how we make our work more transparent and how we're making decisions, what money is available, what's being committed. Um, I had a have some questions about um, the underspent funds, whether they're actually contracts are being signed and things are being spent without the board ha having had access to uh, wh whether or not that's happening or not, um, and whether or not a corrective, and I guess whether or not a corrective action plan has been signed with Metro. Um, I think we, for our community to continue to, to trust um, and continue to support the actions and provide the funding for our work. Um, I hope that we can make our work more um, transparent in our, in our 
or push it into our public meetings so that people can see our decision-making process, um, what's, what's being weighed, the criteria, how we're actually moving things um, forward in terms of uh, spending the dollars. And I know we have a meeting this, this afternoon, and apparently tomorrow we're going to get answers to the questions that we submitted two weeks ago, um, which should help provide that, but again, pushing it into, into the public space so that we can really take advantage to, um, of all the people in this community who um, bring a lot of collective wisdom um, and who are going to, we're going to need their support and actually them to help implement um, all of our plans. So again, I would just encourage that we push more of our work into our meetings and being transparent, even though it's messy sometimes or we don't have all the answers, um, but so people can see our um, decision making process um, and that they can see a path forward in which we're making progress, which I do think we, we will be, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not apparent. Um, so I hope that we can look at our future agendas and how we structure those in, in ways in which we maximize both the board, board discussion, because I know I learn something every uh, meeting from my, my colleagues on the board, but also um, polling the community and to help us um, really deal with a, a, a crisis in which we um, haven't seen in a long time that we, we do need everybody's collective um, best thinking um, about. Uh, so that's that's one thing. And then um, also just as a follow-up to last week's uh, time, uh, place, and manner uh, hearing, our agenda item where the city came and presented um, along with central city concern about um, their plans are rolling things forward. Um, I communicated to the, uh, the chair that um, I'll be looking at um, also asking for an agenda item in September to move the county's work uh, forward on that. Um, and just and as a second um, piece, just again around more making the work um, visible to the community, asking for quarterly financial reports for the county so that um, I, it's kind of a dry topic and not everybody's going to want to see the <laughs> quarterly financial reports, but it's a very important mechanism by which we can understand um, how our resources are being spent or if there's underspend um, and not waiting for the sort of year in financial reporting to know sort of where we landed on, on things. So that would be another thing that I'm interested in moving forward. Um, and I just, again, offer to the chair and other commissioners and staff, I'm, my, my office and myself are more than willing to help in any way uh, we can to move, move things forward and um, support the, the, the work of the, of the county um, and its really important role in re addressing the um, issues, the huge issues in front of us um, related to homelessness and also behavioral health. So uh, offer in the spirit of that, I'm working all month um, and um, here every day to provide whatever support and help I can to move our work forward. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate um, both of the, all of the topics that have been raised. I will say, um, Commissioner Burnham Edwards, that next Thursday we are having um, a board work session, which we haven't done before, which is really important to me, I think, to have a better conversation and to have a chance for us to, to really talk about the supportive housing services measure, um, unanticipated revenue, um, and what are the board's priorities, what are the public's priorities for these dollars. We are going to be in a different setup for the board meeting, so we're actually going to be down here. We're going to bring in more tables and be setting up so that we're all at the, the kind of same table. I think that will be helpful. Um, my intention for that meeting is to really um, make sure we're sharing the groundwork. Um, so we're going to be hearing from one of our uh, county attorneys about the the potential, you know, what the is uh, potential uses for those money can be, what allowable, not potential, but what allowable uses are can be, and then we can go from there with with folks' ideas. That is going to be, you know, part of our board meeting. We'll do something similar on the 24th as well. I think the issue with starting those conversations is that. We are a very small group right now, and to have a, a, the conversation that's really inclusive of everyone's ideas, and um, uh, you know, in this is we. I just want to make sure that everyone has a chance to participate in that conversation. I also want to remind you that we're not going to know what the underspending amount actually is until the end of this month, until about October or August 31st. Any um, dollars that have been spent 
um, or any contracts that have been signed in that, that relate to the cap are part of that $40 million that was approved in the budget that we passed in June. So there, that was a part of the cap. And, and we are meeting later today, and we can go through this in much more detail because I know it's a little bit different. But we won't know until the end of this month exactly what any, you know, if there are any dollars at all based on the rate of spending for the last quarter. But what we do know is that we have unanticipated revenue, and that's what we are going to be um, discussing and, and, and talking about, again, publicly as a board in, in the meetings for the, for the next several weeks. And I think that is a very important thing. I know that's a priority for you. It's also a priority for me. Um, I wanted to also make sure that you had access to the budget notes that were passed during the last during the budget in June because there are several different um, budget notes that relate to the board getting updated on um, on spending like budgeted versus actuals spending around the um, the um, American Rescue Plan dollars that we have um, and so those are those are um, scheduled to be to be happening and so I want to so if you don't have access to those I want to make sure you get access to those and we can talk about where those fall on the calendar but um, the financial and budgeting reporting really is looking at you know where we are in terms of um, the summary of our one-time only general fund budget our American rescue plan budget and projected expenditures around those um, things as we as we move through the the year to help again, not just have it be a part of like what the chair receives as part of the budget process, but have that for the whole board and have it be a part of the public. So, so I can get you more details on those as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm just looking at um, the snapshots that are provided, and so I'm not seeing the quarterly, and I understand that hasn't been part of, I, I did uh, review all the budget notes, but I'm not seeing like quarterly financial reporting. And again, from my just work on other uh, public institutions, um, that being a really important mechanism, um, just the fact that it has to be reported um, actually, change, I think, changes the dynamic. Um, so I hope that we're getting the, so anyway, I didn't see it on the um, snapshot, so just um, that's why I made that request. And I understand it hasn't been done in the, in the past. Um, and I guess on, uh, uh, so you mentioned that in their spending, we're not going to know until the end of the um, month on what the underspend is on the cap. So it would be helpful if everybody, all the commissioners had access to the cap's been signed and what's being spent ag against that. Um, so we were presented at the last meeting, um, the attachment one, which had $60 million in items of spend. So it'd be useful to understand what the, what the cap is and what items between when we got that presentation of proposed spend of like what actually is in flight, um, just so we can ha we can have a better understanding of what both the under un unanticipated but also there's an increment over the forty million that wasn't in the budget is my understanding. So I mean that piece hopefully will be part of the the presentation part of the discussion next week. Um, in addition, it, it would just be helpful and if we had before next week. Um, I think that's a great forum to have more interaction um, in a sort of work session setting is that we have the materials in plenty of time in, in advance so that we can make, you know, make sure that we're not asking staff at the meeting for things that they don't, that's not expected. Um, or clarification, we're not spending time on clarification, but then also what, what is this, the process by which we're gonna have the discussion so that we can make sure that we, um, while we've got everybody there, that we can get through um, a, a process by which we're not, so it's not all a presentation to us and then we um, have, we, we don't end the meeting with landing on like how are we actually going to land on a process so people people understand it. I mean, I'm just think there's a high level of scrutiny because of the underspend and also the it, it's a lot of money. And I think it, we we've got to end the we've got to end the process with actually measurable improvement yeah. or being able to show me measurable progress. Yeah, and we'll and I think the meeting we have this afternoon will be helpful, and I'll make sure that information about the the details around the cap spending are, are shared throughout the prior board and. We have one, I think, b brief presentation that is about 15 minutes long 
right, um, on a different topic that's that was already on the agenda. Um, and then we are going to have, like I said, a short um, update to the board and also to the public around like where we are with it. But the majority of the time is just for discussion. So this is again. Um, a, an opportunity for the board to bring forward priorities for these dollars, right? Like what what the board would like to see, what your ideas are for for the use of the unanticipated, and really that conversation. And again, the the work session part of it is really about our you know the opportunity for the board to have that conversation. So we can talk about that more this afternoon. Um, I did want to respond though to um, Commissioner Myron about the the deaths that we're seeing in the jails. I mean, this is completely unprecedented, and I know people don't like to use that word because it was used so much during COVID, but it absolutely is. The fact that since last um, spring we have had six deaths in the jail is devastating, and it is devastating to the families of the people who have died in custody. It is uh, devastating to the staff that in our, our corrections team, our corrections health team, um, that is happening. Um, I have had conversations with the sheriff about what is happening. Um, we had an hour long meeting yesterday where I asked what are the immediate things that you are doing to um, address this situation? What are the long term things that you are doing to address the situation? And these are building on conversations that we have had, you know, over the past several months around these deaths that um, the deaths that had been happening previously. So obviously, um, we are we're seeing impacts because of Fentanyl, we're seeing impacts because of staffing challenges, which um, there have been a lot of work to address those. Um, you know, the corrections deputies, the, the requirement to go down to the state for training and the lack of opportunity, you know, frequent opportunities for them to do that means we are having whole segments of, of um, deputies go at one time, which put a huge um, a strain on that. And it's also um, had impact to our corrections health being able to access that. And so there have been, um, one of the things I'm, I'm really glad for is that we have been able to facilitate um, daily meetings between corrections health and, um, and deputies and assign deputies to corrections health so that they're able to engage more with the adults in custody who need it, and that I think is a, is a huge thing. There's, um, there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more work that the sheriff is doing, and I know she's looking for the opportunity to, um, to discuss that tomorrow in the tour that we're all going on um, to the jails, but I think it's also... Um, appropriate for her to come to the board and, and, and present on what on the work that is happening as well. So. No, I, I appreciate that. And just for, just to clarify, um, it was, I had read, I'd read in the paper um, that it was five deaths since May. You mentioned six deaths since last spring. Is, I'm, that, what are the what are what number what is the number of deaths since May? I guess is. I'll confirm because okay. I don't want to mix up. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. You know, right. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, just want to to understand that, and then also um, we had undergone a lot of. I had worked with Corrections Health under a couple of different health department directors, and then a couple of different behavioral health division directors, um, and a Corrections Health director. Um, who is now gone, and worked with the deputies on suicide watch and plans around that so that we have ways to ensure if any of these deaths are related to uh, death by suicide, then, um, you know, we had been working on a plan that was sort of deprioritized by the former chair, uh, and there's been multiple turnovers since then, but uh, I feel like that is something we should be picking up the pieces of with corrections health and in concert with our uh, deputy, the, the corrections deputies to, to work on a plan for suicide prevention and watch. And, um, and so I, you know, I look forward on further engagement, but thinking more in the terms of the urgent, you know, hopefully not over months, but this, something drastic has happened and we should be, you know, really, really on that. And, um, and I just also want to uh, piggyback on a little bit of what uh, Julie, uh, Commissioner Brim Edwards uh, raised. She you did, did a really great job of sort of, I, I support what she's asked for and appreciate we'll have a work session. Um, you know, more, more broadly about 
I didn't realize August 15th and 17th meetings were canceled, but I, it feels like there have been fewer meetings than usual, uh, and the agendas in meetings are not often some, not substantive, like the, there's work that needs to be done, and, and as commissioner, the commissioner mentioned, sort of, we have the behavioral health crisis, we have the fentanyl crisis, we have the homelessness crisis, we have animal shelter, like we have all of these things going on, and so not having meetings or having meetings that don't address some of these substantive issues feels like we have an opportunity to, to just even if there won't be a quorum to, to have the meeting, uh, I mean not if there won't be a quorum, if all of us won't be there to have meetings because the work has to get done whether or not all of us are here. And so um, just encourage board meetings to be with substantive action and then you know extra time for work sessions and briefing times for things that don't require sort of that action and public engagement in the same way. So yeah, I appreciate, yeah, appreciate. No, I appreciate and I and I want us to be doing more of these work sessions too. I think that's going to be really important for a conversation and that's a model I'd like us to to so I appreciate all that. All right, I want to appreciate everyone for today. That concludes our regular meeting. There being no further business, we are adjourned.